This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good. Well, welcome to this uh, first meeting of the term of the Digital History Seminar at um, the Institute of Historical Research. Um, welcome to both everybody in the room and everybody online. And tonight, we have two speakers, um, John Schofield, who's the Cathedral Archaeologist at St. Paul's Cathedral, and John Ward from North Carolina State University at Raleigh. And they're going to be describing and illustrating um, their project, which is the Virtual St. Paul's Cross, and, um, and it's a Virtual St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, yes, Cross Project. Cross Project, yes. yes. And over, over to uh, John Ward. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, on behalf of my colleague, John Schofield, uh, I would like to express my uh, thanks for this invitation and deep appreciation for the opportunity to be here to talk with you. Uh, the, uh, the pioneering work of folks in the London academic area in the digital humanities is well known in the States and admired, and uh, so I feel it's an honor and privilege to to have a voice in uh, your deliberations and your discoveries and your work. Uh, John and I are going to talk about the Virtual Paul's Cross Project, uh, which is a project that started uh, several years ago and has been funded by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, in the United States, uh, a, a something that I, I feel the need to acknowledge in a time in the States in which uh, government funding of research, whether it be in the humanities or in the sciences, is under uh, challenge. And uh, uh, it's important to, to recognize and to acknowledge the kind of pioneering work that can only happen when a government actively supports both the arts and the sciences. Uh, the Virtual Pulse Cross Project is a project that uses two different kinds of, of digital technology. One is visual, one is acoustic. And uh, to give an overview of, of what this is about, the easiest thing that I can do is to show you a very brief video that we made in Raleigh uh, for a installation of this project in a technology-rich room in our uh, James B. Hunt library, a room with uh, 10 high-definition projectors which project a seamless image at 270 degrees uh, around the room and a 21 speaker immersion acoustic uh, array uh, that really in effect takes the model out of the computer and brings it into, moves the, the audience into the model. Uh, and so uh, I would like to show you this video. seems to be frozen. Any ideas? Hmm. Let's do escape. Yeah. Okay, that's loading. Yeah. Hit play again, see where we go. All right. The Virtual Pulse Cross Project is an effort to recreate two hours of time in London in the early 17th century in a particular place. The sermon was delivered every Sunday between 10 and 12 uh, and some days during the week. The sermon that we're modeling is actually for, was delivered on Tuesday because it had to be delivered on November the 5th, Gunpowder Day. What we're trying to do is to create as multidimensional an experience as we possibly can at least to give the flavor of what it was like to be there and hear one of these sermons. Well, to put together the simulation, it's been a really layered process. It includes a whole transatlantic team of participants. Uh, so we began here in Raleigh actually putting together a couple of models, one a visual model and one a digital audio model. Uh, and so we're working with very little evidence because it, it's old St. Paul's, by the way, because it burned down. There's new St. Paul's, and if you go there today, you can see new St. Paul's built over top of portions of old St. Paul's. So the evidence we, we have for the model. 
puddles include things like uh, archaeological surveys, engravings, uh, the Gipkin painting, but very few things exist from the era of the church that give us a real accurate portrayal. So the architects are now able to design buildings in a computer and then evaluate the sound, how sound will behave in the building. They are able to do this for buildings that do not yet exist, buildings that are still in the process of design. So if you can do that for a building that doesn't exist yet, you can also do it for a building that used to exist but doesn't exist anymore. So we put together all of these different resources and the two models that we've made. One, the visual model is there to give really strong detail of what the space would look like, uh, what the materials look like, their textures. Uh, and with those models, we're actually able to even simulate what the weather conditions and atmosphere might be like in the churchyard. Now, with the audio model, it's a different story. The audio model is actually a, a much reduced model that gives us the geometry of the space, but also is it, it allows us to assign material characteristics to the walls so that we know how reflective they were, and how absorptive they were in, in terms of sound. With that kind of data, the acoustic engineers we've worked with have been able to create a highly accurate model of how sound behaved in Paul's churchyard in 1622. While we're putting together these models here in Raleigh, uh, we had audio recordings in anechoic chambers going on in England. And uh, Ben Crystal, who's a really well-known Shakespearean actor, recorded the sermon for us there. And so the two things come together, the model and the sound recordings in Boston, back to the US for this part, where uh, engineers, sound engineers at Syntec in Boston put these two things together. And so they can actually project the recording, the sound recording, into the virtual three-dimensional space of the model. And again, we get this accurate portrayal of what it might have sounded like. This project transforms teaching because it enables us to explore with our students a sermon as an experience that unfolds in real time, not simply a printed essay on a page. Thank you. I must say that I forgot to identify the other talking head in that video, uh, my colleague David Hill, who is an associate professor of architecture in the College of Design at NC State University who supervised graduate students in architecture uh, in building the visual model. And for more on the visual model, I'll turn this over to the person without whom we could have done none of this because he is our resource for uh, hard data and information and uh, uh, everything to do with St. Paul's Cathedral. In I'm your master of reality. You are <laughs> my master of reality. Yes. Right, good afternoon. Um, I am John Schofield, the cathedral archaeologist, and um, in this rather hybrid presentation, I'd like to fill in between two parts of John's presentation by explaining. Um, the, uh, what we know about St. Paul's, what uh, is the nature of the material that we can work with. Not only looking back at the last two or three years for his project, but it's only one fairly small part, as you will see, as hopefully you are beginning to understand, of the complex of St. Paul's, but his long-term wish to reconstruct the entire cathedral. And just so we're very clear, um, I may underline two or three points as we go along. The first is that this presentation is, is about uh, the medieval cathedral, not about Wren. And the medieval building um, is found sticking out in, in one part above ground, uh, below the Wren building, which destroyed it. And in other parts, it's underground. So there is a little bit of the plan there are two kinds of models, as we've said. One is the acoustic model, very simple, that we're not going to talk about. The second that we are going to talk about is the virtual model. And it seems to me, when one designs what one wants to do, there are two kinds of models to think about. The first is you can get away with still pictures of 
increasing complexity, or you can think about making movies. And both of those are what uh, I'm interested in. A very quick view of the last 10 years in archaeology. In 2005, we were, um, as in the upper two pictures, uh, this is uh, a priory uh, I excavated and, and reconstructed. Uh, those of you who know about such programs will, will recognize it, very simple, uh, and you can make simple movies. What has happened in the most recent years, as shown by the bottom left, is the arrival of SketchUp and uh, clothing of SketchUp models, uh, here brought into 3DS Max, uh, a model uh, with, with photographs, which is a, a great step forward. Um, that's fine for buildings that you know about that you can go and photograph. This, I think, is a church in Baltimore, but that is a, a luxury we don't have. Now, the material for the reconstruction of medieval St. Paul's, and we're aiming for about 1600, is uh, uh, we have a ground plan from various sources. Here's the, the plan of the cathedral. It's the largest building. It was the largest building in medieval Britain, and around it we know the sites, though not the configuration of the usual buildings you will find in a cathedral close. The deanery, the present, the chancellor, treasurer, all that stuff. And although it's not marked in particular, uh, the area that John and I have modelled so far with our colleagues is this northeastern part where it says Paul's Cross. This was the northeast, or sometimes called the cross churchyard. And that, by the 16th century, was the site of uh, the St. Paul's industry in the selling of books, which is intimately related to the sighting of the cross. The building itself, we know from a few um, pre-fire panoramas, most notably uh, some from the outside, and especially internal views by a chap called um, Wenceslas Holler in the 1650s, just before it burned down. So we have some idea of the extent in three dimensions, but of course, being engravings, they're all in monochrome. There are a couple of pictures of the fire-damaged ruin from which we find, as we might suspect, if we compare this with other cathedrals which have survived, Peterborough, Ely, Norwich, um, Canterbury, that St. Paul's Cathedral was not of one period in 1666. There were five centuries of architecture which made up this great um, uh, um, structure. Parts of it were falling down. But there, there are up to five centuries of architecture to a model. Um, here you see this, the south transept, and um, there's, you see the Norman work there, little uh, uh, blind arcading, just like in Norwich or Peterborough. Um, of the early 12th century, late 12th century arcade going off that way. Medieval work shown by, by these archers, probably the great architect and medievally, and then a whole refacing by Inigo Jones in the 1630s uh, produced these volutes, heavy cornice, and uh, these uh, Renaissance windows. So that uh, uh, post 1620s period, we would have to strip off which means we have to guess, really, what the building looked like underneath the phase that we are stripping off to, to get it uh, uh, to the proper date. Here is one of Holler's uh, engravings of the inside showing the nave, which is of the 12th century. There are one or two uh, records, documentary records, but virtually nothing we have to reconstruct the building history of the church from whatever means we can. But this shows a nave um, of remarkable homogeneity, indeed rather suspect homogeneity, um, 12 bays long and up by 1190. We can match this engraving evidence with stones from these piers because they are found in the walls of the Wren building. The Wren building down below is built of all the medieval buildings jumbled up and reused as rubble. So when a, a wall is pierced for passage, the stones spew out. And from them, as you see on the left, we're able to, the right, I beg your pardon, 
um, we are able to uh, use a plan of a pier, in fact, uh, given to us by Christopher Wren in 1665, and these are the bits of stone that we found from which we can make an accurate reconstruction of the plan of one of these piers. Then we can attempt to build a 3D model. And in this, we start with the master himself. We start with some drawings produced just before the fire by Christopher Wren. There's his signature up there. Um, and although he was thinking of recasting the building in classical form, the basic structure which he measured would be the Romanesque building. So we can take the elevation here, um, and certainly the width of the building, and the height, probably, and we have the medieval building, the skeleton of it. So now uh, I too have a draft person who's uh, adept at SketchUp. And what we're doing, while John goes off to get his money for the next phase, is that we're seeing how far we can explore the medieval building by looking at the problems of reconstructing little parts of it. This is uh, his reconstruction of this space. Um, a reconstruction of the nave, uh, sorry, of the, of the, yes, of the nave, with a central vessel and the two aisles. Um, in progress, as you see, it doesn't have any windows. Um, and this is what he's produced most recently, where we can say, well, some details we know was there. Uh, I know the, 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 the plan of the pier, I know the the height of the elevation, I've just shown you that. I know there was blind arcading around the walls. What I don't know is what the windows looked like. So we are gradually going to bring in windows from medieval churches. And what my draftsman has done most recently is he's taken the window, I've told him, um, from a, a recording by, by Victorian antiquarians, actually, of, of a church somewhere up in Suffolk, I think, and put it in the wall. So I think I shall now say, well, it would have been bigger, so let's stretch it a bit, and there'll be a dialogue until I'm happy about the reconstruction of this particular part of the nave. But I hope you can see that we're beginning to get atmosphere. What we haven't got, and the, anon, the, the blandness of SketchUp assists us defending ourselves by saying, I don't think we will ever approach the colour or if we do, it's going to have to be something rather arbitrary. A medieval church was full of colour, and yet I don't know what it looked like in St Paul's at all. Um, very briefly, this is the choir. There were various uh, other parts of the, of the building which were built at different times. This is the Gothic choir, which will be a different part from the nave and will have to be modelled differently. The choir stalls are Holler's invention. We'll have to invent some new choir stalls. Now, if I briefly um, just talk about one particular problem which interests me, which is how we can use the, the moulded stones, as I call them, the architectural fragments dug up at various times, how far we can tighten the focus in reconstructing the details of this building. In the Wren building, there is a store of 700 stones from the medieval cathedral of which these are some, and there's a notable one on the right. It illustrates, um, or it, as well, I can uh, 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 use that to illustrate a problem, which is that at the east end there was a colossal rose window, unfortunately shown three different times by Holler in three engravings. But this has been reconstructed by a colleague called Mark Samuel from one or two fragments. This is 38 feet long, which is about as wide as this room, I think. And you can see his reconstruction there on the right. So the question for our SketchUp colleague is going to be, can you reconstruct that tracery? Then there will be the glass problem. We have no sliver at all of medieval stained glass from the cathedral, which must have been, like any other church, a blaze of coloured light. So we can say that the 
Rose at the east end looked like one of its immediate forebears, as you see on the right, that's the south transept at, no at Notre Dame, and that's the inside of Notre Dame. I think we shall have to borrow the glazing from these other prominent churches. But that's no problem. Um, and then we we'll have to see how far we can use the architectural fragments, which of course can be photographed and drawn, put in AutoCAD and so on, to reconstruct the detail, how far detail, how far we will go. Um, some of the monuments were extremely fine. We have parts of them. In the upper right you see part from a door, a jam of a door, which has two, two coats of paint on it, two colours, from the 12th century. And then in the bottom right, I don't think we'll ever get to this part, but in the choir there were niches with tombs of two Saxon kings, and if you look very carefully, the, uh, where, where the arches join each other, there are human heads. So I would love to get to modelling those, but I don't think we'll ever get that far. So, um, in conclusion, um, I've been able to supply the plan uh, for John's evolving project of, the, of, of Paul's Cross, which you see here in the foreground. And I'm very interested in uh, plans, which hopefully he will outline, of his grander plan to reconstruct the entire building. With the caveat that whatever we do, it's got to be better than this. This is what reconstructors were drawing by hand over 130 years ago. These are two Victorian reconstructions. Uh, one of the, of the nave on the left and the cross-section of the choir on the right. And we can't better them. I can't, I can't seriously fault either of these drawings. So we've got to somehow push the art of reconstruction beyond these drawings from 140 years ago. That's all I'd like to say. Um, do you want to... If you're just taking back to the right. browser... If I can, yes, yes, there we go. Now, is that, is that you? Oh. Yeah, there we yes. go. Right. John has, as, as John has pointed out, one of the things that's been very intriguing about this project has been the way in which we have hard data. We have measurements of the foundations of the cathedral. We have foundation, the foundations and the location of Paul's Cross itself. We have the foundations of the measurements of the foundations of the bookshops that uh, ringed the, the cross yard. And that, these things have enabled us to um, create the model, uh, create the visual model. Uh, we have, uh, as uh, David Hill mentioned in the, uh, and then I have a fly around video of the, the visual model that um, uh, I'd be happy to show you, but for the sake of time, and I've got some other things I want to talk to you about, we'll, we'll skip. Uh, but um, it's on, the, on this website, which I invite you to explore. There's an enormous amount of material here. Uh, but the, um, the model, uh, the, the, uh, as David said in the video, the, we took the visual model. Well, we did two things. Once we got the visual model, we did two things. The, the first thing was to incorporate into the model elements of time and weather. Uh, one of the things that, that I find challenging when I look at uh, visual models of uh, 3D models of historic places is that everything is from the same moment. Everything looks brand new, even though, of course, in the, the, the space you're modeling, there are buildings that are, 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 are new and there are buildings that are 50 years old and buildings that are 500 years old. Uh, and certainly, um, their visual appearance would reflect uh, their time uh, since the time since their, their construction. Uh, so we've also brought in conditions of time and weather. Uh, we researched the, the, the sermon that we modeled is, is the Gunpowder Day sermon, November the 5th, uh, in uh, which on the, the, the calendar, on the Julian calendar, is actually November the 15th on the, on the Gregorian calendar that we use today. So we're really looking at a date in mid-November. And uh, the odds are something like 85% uh, that it's uh, in favor of it being cloudy. Uh, and so we have brought in the angle of the sun and everything else to make the model uh, aged and also time and climate appropriate. 
We then took the model, simplified it, sent it to the acoustic engineers, and they produced uh, an acoustic model. And uh, in the acoustic model, we can do a number of things. And what I want to show you, demonstrate for you now, are some of those things. Um, here is the churchyard, empty of human life. Imagine that you are walking, it, it, this, is, this is November the 5th, 1622, and you are showing up early to get a good seat, and no one is there. Uh, and so, um, uh, so what is there? The famous John Gipkin painting, which uh, is down here, um, tells us that there were at least that the, the ambient noise of this space can contain the sounds at least of birds, horses, and dogs. And so we have birds, horses, and dogs that you will hear uh, barking and clopping and uh, flapping their wings. And the church bell, which marks the time, the, the cathedral, the clock at St. Paul's rang a bell on the quarter hour and on the hour. So we can listen with ambient noise. We can then add people uh, in different numbers. And uh, what we, uh, once we recorded crowd sounds, then we recorded uh, the sermon itself. Uh, we produced <coughs> a, we asked David Crystal, the linguist, to produce a script in early modern London pronunciation, and the script was then performed by uh, David's son, Ben, who is a professional actor, uh, so that the, the, script, the sounds of John Dunn's voice you hear are in uh, David's reconstruction of early, early modern English London uh, pr pronunciation. And we can uh, explore the audibility. We can hear the opening of the sermon from eight different positions in the churchyard and in the presence of four different crowd sizes. The crowd sizes are calibrated to match two things, the visual record, uh, the Gipkin painting, how many people that shows, and other uh, images of a Paul's Cross sermon in process. And the higher, not, which are fairly on the small end, on the, the high end, uh, the uh, historic record shows, uh, tells us that, uh, well, John Jewell wrote a letter in the middle of the 16th century, right after the Elizabethan settlement, in which he said that the number of people who came for sermons at Paul's Cross ranged from five to 6,000 people. So we tried to, to model uh, sizes of people that, um, sizes of crowds that, that reflect the start record. Let's just go to site one, the closest to the, to the churchyard. Here are some things to listen for. Listen to how well you, first of all, how well you hear the speaker. Secondly, you're in the crowd. The crowd, when the crowd responds, it's going to be a, a, a good sound for the crowd. The crowd gets louder the larger the crowd. Listen for um, echo. Listen for reverberation. And let's just start up close with 500 people. I'm now going to go to uh, the position um, uh, for someone listening from the sermon house, which is the, the, the sheltered area to the left of the preacher in the churchyard. This is where the Lord Mayor of London and other people of quality got to sit out of the elements. Uh, and let's go there and let's increase the size of the crowd just a little bit. But listen, the, the, the preacher says, the Lord be with you, and everyone responds, and with thy spirit, and then he says, let us pray. Uh, the, in the recording, there's a fixed interval between the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Uh, listen to whether you, the, uh, in the recording you just heard, they said the Lord be with you and they said, the congregation said and with thy spirit and Dunn said let us pray and you heard all of those things. Let's see if we can hear it in, from location two.
just barely hear the word pray. Much more reverberation. And so if you work around, you can, as a, you can explore the, the, um, the quality of the sound from the, from the eight different listening positions. Uh, one of the, this is a major part of the website because one of the initial issues that we were most interested in was the question of audibility. Uh, if, this, if the Paul's Cross sermon is as we have come to believe it is, the point at which the government and the state church and the general population of London kind of intersected, and this is where the folks found out what was going on, uh, the policies of the, the crown were defended in religious matters, and the controversies of the English Reformation were argued back and forth uh, through the, the late 16th and into the 17th century. How well did it work? Uh, a space that's approximately 150 by 180 feet uh, for people to stand in, uh, how well could they hear an unamplified voice? And it turns out uh, that they could hear from pretty much any position in the rooms in the space so long as the crowd is quiet. Uh, if, they were, if the preacher were speaking in an open field and you were 150 feet away, you would not be able to hear him. So it is a consequence of the arrangement of the space that the preacher is audible. Uh, and, and so this is, this is something that we have learned in the process of, of developing this project, uh, and it's been one of the, been one of the major learnings. Um, the, uh, but there are differences in sound quality. The reason why you can hear from anywhere is that, in effect, the buildings around, the reverberation of the quality of sound that's created by the buildings all around the churchyard uh, make it possible for the sound to bounce and in effect be amplified in a kind of natural way as it proceeds from the preacher out to the back of the space. But that's conditional not only on the configuration of the space, but it's also conditional on the pace of the speaker. Uh, if the speaker spoke at a much more natural or conversational pace, his, the word he spoke after the word he just spoke would get all jumbled up in the reverberation and you, he would you, you could hear his, you, could, you would know that he was saying something, but um, uh, you, would, you would not be able to make out clearly what he was saying. If he speaks at the deliberate pace that Ben Crystal adopted for the delivery of the sermon, uh, you can, um, uh, that, that's how it's possible. So here is, in effect, one of the things that we have learned about the conditions of performance and the technique of performance that we did not know. The, uh, the, the question of the pace of delivery is not something uh, that is part of any description of Dunn's or as far as I know anyone else's preaching style at Paul's Cross. Uh, that would have varied if you were in a smaller space. Obviously, you could use a much more uh, conversational pace of speaking. But here, uh, this particular style of delivery seems to be called for. Um, the website contains the entire sermon. It's two hours and 10 minutes long uh, with the prayer before it. Uh, you can hear it from uh, two different positions in the churchyard. You can hear it from the, um, from the, from about 50 feet in front of the cross, and then you can hear it from the sermon house. It's broken up into 15 minute segments according to the ringing of the bell. And one of the major questions that we are beginning to, th to think through now is, what are the consequences for delivery of this reminder of the passage of time every 15 minutes? Uh, at, at a quarter hour, one toll of the bell is not too much of an interruption. But by the time you get to a uh, quarter to the hour, those three tolls uh, take a, a, you know, 15 seconds to be sounded and then for the reverberation to die down. And then when you get to 11 o'clock, the tolling of 11 strikes of the bell takes over a minute. So if you're preaching, how do you handle this timed interruption? And the question is, do you simply, when it happens, do you simply stop and then find out how to restart and reconnect with your congregation wherever you are? or? was done, or the other preachers at Paul's Cross, were they able to anticipate the tolling of the bell and structure the organization of their delivery so that as the time of the bell approached, they would be able to come to a conclusion, make a conclusion, have the bell 
emphasize the conclusion, and then when the bell was over, then they would start with the next point. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm having some very interesting conversations with some of my colleagues in the Dunn business about whether that's possible and what's the case for it and what's the case against it. But the, this is one of the places where this project is raising a point, uh, raising a set of questions that we would not have known, uh, not have thought about before. Uh, these sermons were preached from notes. So the texts that we have are memorial reconstructions, and that also brings up a whole series of questions. Um, I'll, I'll say just briefly, uh, I amplify a little bit about uh, what John said um, about our future plans. We just submitted another application to the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, for a substantially larger sum of money, which if we get it, we will use to realize John's vision and dream of rebuilding the entire cathedral inside and out, and we will create an acoustic model of the interior of the cathedral and restage worship services with choral music, organ and choral music, uh, from the manuscript uh, from the St. Paul's Cathedral, the um, John Barnard manuscript that's at the Royal Academy of Music over in, in the western part of, southwestern part of London. And um, um, th there are many questions about how all this is going to work out. Uh, one other thing we want to do is to figure out a way to show visually in this model and in the model that we eventually hope to build uh, the degree of approximation, the degree of authority, the degree of knowledge, data, and the degree of approximation, or the degree, as John said, of guesswork. Uh, again, one of the, I think one of the limits of many models that we get it happens to be that, that it all looks as though every bit of it has equal authority. And uh, we can, we, one of the things we can do is we can go through this model and I can tell you exactly uh, which elements are based on hard data and which are, are, are more or less uh, approximate approximations or representations. Uh, but uh, one of our goals is to make that information part of the display uh, as we present it. And I think that's a good place to stop and we would be delighted for uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, information, uh, collaborative uh, conversation. Thank you, Thank you very, much. very much. Criticism. Criticism. Yes. Yes, yes, as John just said, criticism, uh, what, have we over, what major uh, things have we overlooked? I think that's a fan, it's a fantastic project, and the, the website is just really compelling, and I've spent a fair bit of time just kind of, kind of um, playing around, good, and good. I do think that it's, as far as I can tell, unique in, in terms of actually allowing that kind of, well, open access, interactive mm -hmm. uh, thing with sound. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's hugely impressive. The, the things that um, I keep on coming back to are, and this is a question to both of you, I mean, in a sense, you know, from the text, mm -hmm. you, put, you, you obviously have a series of research questions mm -hmm. and presumably research answers, mm -hmm. and, and the, 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 the sounds of the bells and, and, and that are yes. all there. But also, presumably, from an arche um, archaeological perspective, there's also a sense of, of having a different way of interrogating the stones. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I suppose if I could just prompt you both to say a little bit more about um, what the process of modeling and creating this has done to change how you actually read all the stones in the text. Well, it hasn't changed anything so far. I think I just want to experience what it was like to walk inside St. Paul's, uh, a building you know, w with which I've lived for the last 20 years. And um, so um, increasingly, as computers get better and our manipulation of them get better, or as I often say, uh, computers have now caught up with our desires, we can now do this. Um, um, so I look forward to designing movies, maybe even interactive movies where you can actually govern where you go, um, uh, looking at details in the cathedral. But that's a long way away. Um, but uh, that's the vision. Have you, have you looked at that um, at site? It always just seems to me with Baroque buildings in particular, you just can't understand them except in candlelight. Um, and presumably there's, uh, there's, a, there's a certain element of that for a medieval cathedral as well. Um, I, I don't know. At the moment we've just got this bland white model, which will then be clothed in colour to some extent. As I said, I, I have severe misgivings about trying to colour the walls. Yeah. But once I get going on the stained glass, and you can beam the stained glass colour mm -hmm. into the building, um, as, as happens in modern churches, mm -hmm. uh, we can get some very nice coloured effects. 
That's my answer. To me, the, the um, well, a couple of things. One is that, that this has, doing this project has, has challenged me to figure, to answer questions like how it was done, how, it, how was the Paul's Cross sermon stage? We know it was outdoors, we know from which it was, where it was preached. <coughs> Um, how do you get the attention? If you are the preacher, how do you get the attention of a crowd of that size? And one of the, for me, one of the most exciting things in the John Gipkin painting, which we refer to several times, and if I'm very fortunate, I can find the, the uh, painting over that. Here's, a, here's the way our model looks, just the model. And then one of the graduate students took stills from the model like this one and took it into Photoshop and added time and age and birds and clouds. Um. You say about the buildings. You may ask, where are the buildings coming from? Because we know nothing about the buildings around the churchyard. Um, they are stolen from uh, Litchfield and Lincoln, uh, Chichester. I supplied some models. Uh, um, and uh, they, they clothed uh, John's students, did a good job in, in, in um, taking out the modern windows and the modern street lamps, I think, at one point. Yes. Um, uh, there was a, a one-way sign, wasn't there? Yes, there was a one-way, that's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, which we uh, fortunately caught. Um, yes. And um, it works very well. Is it fabrication? Yes. But it's the best I can do. Um, and um, nobody's uh, quit. I've taken these pictures to um, students of vernacular architecture in Essex, hard-nosed building recorders, and said, can you tell me what's wrong? And they can't. They can't, they can't improve on these on these imaginative exercises, so um, that's good for the for, for the outside. Yes. Well, there there are there are two. I mean, if, when you look at the the churchyard, uh, there are two um, uh, two kinds of uh, approximation <coughs> religious. For example, the cathedral, as John said, I mean, the cathedral is based on John's um, a combination of Schofield and Christopher Wren uh, to get the measurements. Uh, and then we've got the visual imagery. The Paul's Cross preaching station, we know the base because the, 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 the preaching station was excavated in the late 19th century. Uh, and so we know the, the size of the base and then also the size of the little structure itself. But we don't know how tall it was. And so, and you look at the drawings and they are not helpful because they show a building that, that is substantially narrow, smaller, mm -hmm. much taller height in relationship to width. Uh, than the, um, the, 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 ex the excavation mm -hmm. measurements provide for. So with the case of the, the preaching station, it's, um, it's the height of the, the roof that's the most important. The buildings back here, the buildings around the churchyard, we do know the size of their foundation because they were all surveyed after the Great Fire. And in some cases, we know that the building was a three-story or a four-story, and we know whether it had gables or not. This is all part of the survey. And so, as John said, what, people, what the, our guys did was to, working with John, to find buildings of that era that corresponded to the description we had. So they are greater approximations, but nevertheless, they do embody knowledge that we have as well as speculation. Um, Adam? Hi. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this project and I'm seeing it talking to a lot of different types of audiences, some of them academic, some of them not academic. Mm -hmm. Um, and the one that really strikes me as perhaps could be most improved by something like this is actually something like historical fiction. Because what you created here is not what actually happened. I mean, you've got an actor to reenact using right. the best that you have available. Right, yes. Um, but it's still, it's not an exact right. example of, of what right. it was like to right. do that Absolutely. Today. And I'm just wondering, um, thinking things like, like historical fiction, like public archaeology or public history or mm -hmm. academic history and academic archaeology, are you consciously trying to engage distinctly with these different types of audiences, or is this just something that you're uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's something I, would, I think we would welcome. It's, it's, uh, it's not a community with which we had, although my university has a PhD in public history program, and I really should. Uh, get together with some of their folks, and and I, I think that's a very good idea, and I'm I'm glad to have it. Um, for me, the thing that has changed the most is my understanding of what a sermon is. Uh, a sermon to most of us who work in this field, a sermon is the text, and in the case of this sermon, it's a manuscript or it's the text that was published in 1649. Uh, for me, it's not anymore. For me, the text is now a memorial reconstruction. Uh, it's a it's it's a trace of of what really happened. 
in its own way a trace. And one of the things I'm looking for, and I, you know, for example, one of the things I think I found are two of the notes that were on the set of notes that Dunn took into the pulpit that somehow survived. So that in one section of the sermon we have both the note that he wrote down in anticipation of delivering the sermon and then his memory of the actual words he made of that note in the process of delivery. Uh, and so to, to take these, the text and make them much more dynamic and make them much more about reading for the traces of the actual moment of delivery, which is what Dunn cared about and what his congregation cared about. That's the biggest mind concept change in the experience of this project for me. Yeah. Just uh, picking up on both the previous two questions about differing audiences mm -hmm. and the degree to which something is, is accurate or mm -hmm. um, This is a comment rather than a question. Uh, it strikes me that, that, that there's quite a bit of, there's a challenge involved in building a user interface that such that it, 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 that it can be explicit about what is yes. it, it is conjecture, yes. um, what is firm conjecture, what is is actually yes. imported from another from another indeed, indeed. Yes. and actually there's, there's kind of a, a challenge in there, especially if we're talking about multiple audiences yes. with different degrees of literacy about this right. yes. content. So, so, yes. so, uh, so and if you were and if you were publishing publishing this in a more formal way, then it's easier to deal with that. But it, as it escapes into the wild, there's yes. it's a different set of challenges. Yeah. Right. <coughs> we've archaeologically we've tried that handle that problem with our previous project, the Priory I showed you at the beginning, um, uh, where we had some bits uh, uh, in the 18th century of the arches and the rest we reconstructed. So my draftsman at the time uh, coloured them, coloured the real, real bits in yellow and the others were more uh, anodyne. And it looked awful because of course that was not historically accurate either, to have half an arch in yellow. So. Um, yes, it's a, it, it's a big problem how we would identify the bits we were most confident with. Yes. One because of the, you could describe because you could describe it in an appendix in words. Right. Yeah, but, but, yes. but a large portion of you readers will see. Yes. Were yes. Exactly. That, they exactly. Would see exactly. Yes. And assume that it yes. is all at the same level of, of yeah. authenticity. Yes. Yes. There, there are lots and lots of digital models in which simply the, the people are doing them. I mean, I'm thinking of Rome Reborn, which is the one that I'm most familiar with. And there's no effort there to distinguish uh, what's actually there and what is, what is uh, speculation or, or interpretation. Uh, we have a, a line item in the next grant proposal for consultation with someone who really understands digital display to help us think about whether, whether it's an alternative view that you, know, you click somewhere on the screen and, and it changes to show you the levels of the, the degrees of approximation and also in effect if you will the footnotes what kind of authority does any visual object in this field what does it have? We may have to leave that in text you know publish a well, book or something well, you know, put all the, all the caveats in the book yeah. but I think um, what, what these reconstructions already show is something I we both feel very strongly about which is that our model is going to be dirty Yes. All the, all the models you see on the web of reconstructed sites, they're squeaky clean. Right. They, are, they are hopeless in that regard. Yes. Uh, and they must be superseded, including the Rome. But the other um, yes. 3D representations are used by many museums these days. Yeah. But, but they never get beyond flybys, squeaky clean landscapes. They look like that and not like that. They look like things out of a conflict packet. Partly because in a sense it's easier to construct a wireframe than it is then to fill in what the facing looks like. Sure. And, then it's yeah. less yeah. Yeah. and, and the challenge, I mean, one of the challenges for, for movies is, filming is, uh, I mean, a movie is a series of stills. Uh, this is one still. Uh, and a, there's, the, there's a video in here of a fly around of the model, squeaky clean. And the person who did it said it's like, like 10,000 stills to get a, you know, so, so to create, to create a way of getting a movie that is consistently dirty all the way through, that's a whole other order of technological challenge. So, so do we need to then create a, a, essentially a citation format for this? The, yes. We can agree. Yes. 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 That. Yes. That is a yes. Okay. I, I, I think would agree the, with that. The British Library needs to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pass that on some of, some of this work to somebody. Else. I'll pass it on to you. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, James, you yeah. Um, yeah, if I may go back to acoustics Certainly. and 
experience yes. text. So I really love the phrase you used about um, text being memorials of experiences. Yes, that's right. Um, I guess one of the things that struck me whilst you were talking, particularly in the second half, so I spent a lot of time over the years reading bits of plays and mm -hmm. sort of reading about experiences of being in theatres and seeing performance. And I've always felt that sort of the, the, the people who do the stuff about the stuff that happens in front of the stage. Mm -hmm doesn't always get connected with the stuff that's about the reading or the text. Yes, yes, so yes, absolutely. I, I, it was really kind of thinking about, when you said that one of the things this project is you have a shift in thinking about how you consider the text. Yes. And I wondered how far you thought or how many discussions you had with people um, around how much this sort of cast doubt or causes problems for a lot of texts. And there's, I guess the point is there's a lot of people out there who are very happy reading their text and very happy mm -hmm. in their text. Um, and I can imagine that this sort of, this sort of approach can be very, very interesting in a number of settings, but mm -hmm. also kind of upset a lot of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. Well, because, yeah, I, mean, yeah. I spend a lot of time with my abuse, and, you know, right, sure. the people who stand around can yes. be annoying. I'm annoying to everyone else because I'm tall. You know? right. um, yeah. And those kind of things are not captured really in how people Yes, yes, I, I, I agree completely. Uh, uh, Peter McCullough at, at Oxford has done, he has a, has an essay in a new uh, Oxford Guide to John Donne that's just out where he tries to work his way through one of Donne's sermons as a unfolding oratorical structure. And so he sort of looks at the, the flow of the argument moment by moment. And what we're doing is taking what he's doing there and try putting it on steroids. We really are ramping up the, um, the, the, the effort to recover the interactive and the performative. Uh, in one of Dunn's sermons, uh, Dunn says to the congregation at Paul's Cross, some of you get, some of you start talking among, with each other when the preacher makes a point and you persist in talking to each other and so that you delay the course of the preacher for up to a quarter of an hour. Now, <laughs> I think he's exaggerating, uh, but what it suggests very strongly is that, at least in the case of the Paul's Cross sermon, this was a very interactive kind of experience. People were talking back, people were talking to each other, uh, and so there, the, the guy's not up there preaching to a passive audience sitting quietly or um, taking notes as we know some people did. That's not all they're doing. They are responding vocally, physically, and then the question becomes, how do, do these um, incredibly complicated texts, in rhetorically well-structured texts, how does that fit together with this very interactive experience that, that folks seem to to, to have when they expect to have when they went to Paul's Cross. It made me think silly things like, you know, if someone thought a sermon about sounding quite interesting because we catch a lot of it, it's getting more saleable in some strange way. You know, a good noisy audience that somehow or other you've got bits of it from the world that people would rush yes, on the line. Yeah, yes, in that same sermon, Dunn says that some of you who have trouble hearing decide whether it's a good sermon or not depending on how noisy the rest of the crowd is <laughs> who keep you from hearing the thing. <laughs> So, so yes, so bringing all this kind of information, as well as phenomena like the bells ringing every 15 minutes, uh, this, is, this is what is really exciting and compelling to me, for me personally, as well as all the things, neat things we've been able to do with this project. Uh, yeah, thank you. I've got a question from online from Richard, who's one of the reads that can be actually in the room today. Okay. So he has two related questions. If you were to do start over, what would you do differently? Okay. And what one piece of advice would you give to anyone thinking of doing a historical reconstruction like this? I personally, if to answer the second question first, I would say go for it, because I, I think what we have here is a different kind of publication. I think what we have is a form of publication that allows us to integrate into one presentation a whole range of different kinds of evidence, whether it be visual, acoustic, uh, whether whatever kind it is, uh, it's a different way of communicating, a different way of organizing and interrelating and communicating that um, evidence. 
what would what would you do differently? I'll pass to you before. No. Well, well, not much. Um, um, I have just fed information into this model and admired it as it constructed itself. What would you have us do differently if we put it that way? Um, I think I would have told you. <laughs> no, no, I can't think of anything. Um, uh, um, the usual, the usual answer to that is ask for more money. Well, well, uh, well, uh, you know, I mean, the the business about for me it would be to get enough money to get Ben Crystal to do the sermon in several different versions. We just had enough money for him to do it one time. It took a day in the Anacoic recording chamber at, at, at University of Salford in Manchester to get this done, um, and that was all the time and all the money we had. And then we got into this question, we discovered this question about the pace of delivery being essential. And that's the one thing that in the Dunn community I've gotten the most flack about. My John Dunn wouldn't sound like that, is what I've <laughs> you know, and, and so, what so is I, well, <laughs> but in, again, in the grant, the new grant, we have a line item to revisit elements of this project that we'd like to clean up a little bit or that we'd like to be able to explore more with, and that's one of them, to get Ben to do some parts of this at a different pace of speaking. As you mentioned, if, if I were designing the, uh, the big project now, the one that John is just applying for, um, I would be very impressed by the fact that uh, the movie Gravity, the special effects, in fact most of the movie was made at Pinewood, the, the special effects are, are, are state of the art in the cinema industry, and if we could tap that, we could a lot of that into this modeling mm -hmm. for the for the weather for making a movie for mm -hmm. people walking up and down mm -hmm. uh, for sound uh, there's a lot that we could do if we had access to that technology so uh, I've said to John if he doesn't get the grant next time around we shall we should go to either a cinema giant or Google mm -hmm. or Microsoft and and get half a million dollars mm -hmm. <laughs> Teaching undergraduates or something like that. So oh yes, oh yes, yes, yes. The uh, the um, uh, we use it. I, I use it in the, when I teach 17th century literature as as a way of really of getting the the sermon off the page. Uh, I mean, you know, I, the question I get from general audiences more than any other, of course, is why in the world did people gather for two hours on Sunday in all kinds of weather? The sermon survived from Paul's cross, in the printed sermon survived from Paul's cross that were delivered in every month of the year. Um, when, it, when it was snowing, they went inside. They well, did, they did go inside. yes, yes. As a matter of fact, yeah, one of the it's, this is not a secret, but it, it's it's something that's built into this project that is a reminder always to me that this is not time travel, and it's the fact that the as the cover of the sermon says, the the printed version of the sermon says this sermon was prepared to be delivered at Paul's cross, but was instead delivered inside the cathedral because of the weather. So what we're doing is recreating an event that should have happened, but didn't, and it, it, we recreated it uh, the way that it was planned for. <coughs> Dunn gets to deliver, in, in some virtual sense, Dunn gets to deliver that sermon in Paul's cross for the first time, and it only took All him right. 400 years to, to, so to get around to it. He's beaming down on you. He's beaming, oh, I, well. <laughs> There's some spooky things about this. Uh, when, when we went to Manchester to record the sermon, uh, we landed at the, the airport in Manchester, and I was, we were, I was waiting to get my suitcase, and this bag went by, and the tag on the bag said, John Dunn. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. The tag on the bag said, John Dunn, and I turned to speak to, 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 to tell my wife, uh, Look, there's a suitcase there, and then somebody picked it up and walked away, and I never saw who it was. But I felt like we're recording that sermon. In some sense, John Dunn is with us. Now, how's that? But I'm sure that's really silly, but it, it's a sustaining silliness. It's, it's a sign. A sign. Well, okay. I'm very looking forward to getting ready to do some music for this inside the church. Yes. Actually, I think that, and this is kind of an observation to take a whole lot of extra issues coming to view. Oh, absolutely. In a sense, actually, because of course, um, there are buildings 
still the standing that are a little bit like it's all St Paul's right. mm -hmm. those dimensions yes. you speak. I mean, so sure, comparable, sure. right? Oh, John's got a lot of handle here. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and of course, there are choirs singing in these buildings, singing the music that's in those yes. barn apartments. Yes, that's right. So, so yes. that's actually kind of, um, so those choir masters already know that you need to sing this stuff at a certain tempo in order for it right. to sound in the building. So right. I, I imagine actually there will be a lot of musicological interest in here. Yes, in yes, in yes. And the, the folks who are working with us on the musical <laughs> side of this are Roger Bowers, who is oh. the uh, emeritus member of the faculty at, at Jesus College at Cambridge, and Mark Williams, who is the choir master at, at Jesus College. And matter of fact, I'm going to see them tomorrow, and we're going to find out. We're, we're trying to figure out which settings of the services we're going to do. We're going to model, plan to model a festival set of sung services and then a more sort of ordinary time set of more ferial set of services. Um, but the, you know, the, the, uh, you have the organ book, the, the, the Adrian Batten organ book, and John Dunn hired Adrian Batten to be the organ, one of the organists in the Vicar Choral at St. Paul's about 1625. Uh, you have all this, this body of, of music that was composed by musicians at St. Paul's for performance there. And now we're going to get to hear it in the space that they were thinking of when they wrote that music. Now the question of which, or how we're going to recreate the organ, uh, that's a whole other long story. That, uh, and how we're going to get an organ into an anechoic recording chamber. You know, there. And, and actually, and, and find early modern sized voices. Because of yeah. the pitch, the pitch of the yes, that's right. Yes, so a yes. so treble at, at that point doesn't sound like yeah. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> this is this is kind of exactly the kind of we should be come be with us tomorrow and then you what well, these are exactly the thing we're going to be talking about. Yeah. Yeah. This is just an observation rather than a question. It's about the performance aspect that James was mentioning. Uh -huh. um, I mean, it's very <coughs> speculative that they might have twined it around um, right. when the bells were sounding, right. but it, it struck me that that's. That it sounds a little bit like the way writers talk about the difference between writing an hour-long drama to go out on the BBC as opposed to a drama that's interrupted by advertising breaks on a commercial mm -hmm. channel. And yeah. do you structure it differently? Sure. And yeah. it leads up to cliffhangers and things that right. we Right, yes, yes, interested. exactly. So that exactly. whole process that changes how you think about structure. Yes, yes. Really absolutely. Yes, 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 um, yes. And, and so do you find for the cliffhangers that every 15 minutes? <laughs> Uh, let's put it this way. Um, uh, I, 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 it was my job. I got, we had the recording, we had the, the program that enabled me to choose things and, and play, hear, record them as though they would sound in the space. Uh, I'm in, I have the bells and I'm, I'm putting the bells in. And my first thought was, I'll just go to every 15 minutes and put them in. And it was hard to find uh, the place to do it, except that I noticed that maybe 30 seconds in the recording time, 30 seconds uh, either right on or 30 seconds before or a minute after, there was just the kind of oratorical, rhetorical structure break that we're talking about. And I remembered, um, I remember, first of all, I mean, if he actually said these particular words, which I don't exactly think he did, but if he was were saying them, uh, he, in, the, in the delivery, he had the opportunity to speed up, slow down, uh, accommodate a little bit of time either way. So what we wound up doing in the recording, and I'm honest about this on the website, we bent time to fit the rhetorical structure of the sermon on the assumption that Dunn, in performance, could have bent the text to fit the time. I mean, I just keep on thinking back to AJP Taylor doing those you know, half hour long um, lectures and uh, ending absolutely spot on. And you know that he was sitting there with the clock in front of him yeah, and the sweet pan and could, and it's a classic trick of you know, repeating three things so that you get to mm -hmm. get to exactly the right moment mm -hmm. for the, 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 the mm -hmm. thing. But I, 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 there was the clock here. Uh, well, there was an hourglass. Okay. Uh, there was an hourglass and uh, uh, the, so, which is an imprecise, a little bit more, less precise than the digital clock or even a, a, yeah. a clock. Yeah. He wouldn't down. see the clock, is not it? No, yeah. it, probably that was. Yeah. The clock was in the, in the um, north transept facing yeah. him, but it was inside yeah. the building, so um, he would just hear the sounds. Yeah. So but I mean, he, did, yeah. he, he did have the hourglass, and uh, after you do this a few times, I think you, it was just to his right, and 
and I think, I think it, it, with with as a deliberate practice, you could come to anticipate just about when those quarter with the sand level sand level for the quarter hour. I think if you were A.J. Taylor, you would have gotten somebody that's a wave at you or something like that. Just, well, just, just, just well, maybe. The, 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 now, the I hadn't thought of that. Thank you. That's a <laughs> gift. I'll remember that next time, <laughs> time someone says, oh, you're crazy. Um, and, yes. Can I ask how you came to choose this particular sermon? Yes. Uh, two, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, um, this particular sermon exists um, in this manuscript, uh, MS Royal 17BXX, um, the sermon that this sermon, Dunn was asked to preach the sermon by the king. Uh, this is, it's 1622, it's in the middle of the Spanish match controversy, and a lot of public uproar, the, the directions for preachers had been promulgated in, over the summer, and the the king had asked Dunn to preach a sermon defending the directions for preachers in earlier in the fall. And here we come again and, and the king asked Dunn to preach a sermon on Gunpowder Day. And in the course of the sermon, he, he, defends, he, he defends, he reminds people that this is the man who was almost martyred by the, by the Catholics. But he also makes a point of saying that that the king is a Protestant, in spite of the fact that you're afraid, since he's pursuing the Spanish match, that he's getting soft on Catholicism. So it's a very political sermon, and therefore it illustrates a lot of the kinds of things about the Paul's Cross sermon that we were interested in thinking about. Uh, the king wanted to know um, what Dunn said. So apparently Dunn sat down the day after, or a day or two after, uh, the he delivered the sermon. He, he wrote out a draft of the manuscript, which was then taken by the a cop, professional copyist, and this manuscript was created. It was sent over to the, the royal palace where it became part of the, the royal papers. So this is uniquely among at least Dunn's sermons, the closest manuscript copy we have to the actual delivery date. So it's the pro, that was the first thing, it was the proximity of the text. Uh, and the, the combination of that and the, poly, the politically charged nature of the sermon. And then I realized that it had been intended to be a Paul's Cross sermon, but hadn't been. And so the com it, it done it had to preach it inside the cathedral because the, it was raining bad. It was bad weather that day. So the idea that it should have been but wasn't and now we're doing it, combined with the proximity of the manuscript to the delivery, the, that co collection of of, of Aspects of this sermon were the things that, that led me to decide to do this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Obviously, what you're working on here is nobody's really gotten this before, so you're, you're treading into new water. Yes. We've had a lot of conversations around here about the sustainability of projects such as mm -hmm. these digital, um, digital methods and have. I mean, you've got your files relating to the building of the church, and you've got this acoustic model as well, and I'm sure there's people working on other aspects of it. So have you had conversations about how you're going to, I guess, tidy this up into a format that perhaps someone 15 years down the line could then come in and work with, or is this something that's very much a product of your minds that is going to have to stay there? Uh, just a fact. Lots of people are thinking about just the issue. As a matter of fact, the NEH now insists that every grant application have a sustainability plan and a data management plan. And so that, those are two of the things that we had to put together for the grant. Um, and, and one of the thinking about this, I mean, how do we sustain the website? How do we, it, it, and, and there are a whole host of problems I got a commitment from my host institution to sustain the website at least as long as the current administrators are alive and in their positions and are able to do it, uh, able to provide the money to, to rent the space on the university server for the website. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're creating a folder of the, all the data that went into the website and that will be maintained as part of the university library system's archives, just like 
a manuscript or, or a rare book or anything else. And, it, and they are taking on the responsibility for sustaining it, the, the background material. But the humbling reality is uh, file formats change, programs change. Um, to truly to sustain this would require someone going through and keeping the, the uh, hyperlinks alive and uh, sustaining, you know, converting file formats so that future versions, let's say Photoshop or SketchUp or the programs that take their place or the browser formats and all those kinds of things. And uh, the, real, the humbling reality was we could make as deep and profound commitment as we could to management and to sustainability, but we had to acknowledge that we are in effect handing this off to the future with no way of guaranteeing whether someone will flip a switch or pull a plug and uh, it will all go away. Is, is there no interest on the part of the cathedral in uh, using it as part of, the, well, the public history uh, <laughs> side of it? I mean, after all, it does have a... a we are a cathedral. Yeah, it, it, it's got a thousand year conti um, continuity there too. Um, I, I don't represent the cathedral. I am merely one of their consultants. Uh, but as an archaeologist, I would hope that um, the cathedral would see the educational value of this. And at some suitable political point, <laughs> um, I hope to introduce it to the, into the thinking of the present dean and chaplain. Uh, uh, but it's not one of their present concerns. No, they have other things on their minds. They're, the possibilities are really remarkable. I have a, an iPad. David Hill created this using an, uh, an iPad program. Uh, you, can, you can hold it up and you can stand in Paul's churchyard and turn this app on and it will show you how the space before you would have looked in 1622. And as you move the iPad around, move your turn around, the, the view changes to show you exactly what the model would look like in literally in the space. So the possibilities of, of we, we, have, we have tried to think of ways of, of making convincing case that it's commercially beneficial to the cathedral. We haven't quite got our promotional strategy worked out yet, but it is one of the things we're doing. Well, that would be good. When I model a certain part of the cathedral, the south transept or the west end, mm -hmm. and put it into your program, I, I, I would love to go and stand there inside the west end. Yes, we, we can make it possible. As we, we build the cathedral. We can do it. Right. <laughs> Just coming back to that, I, mean, I do hope that you find the opportunity to, to make that case to the cathedral. Because one of the things I like about this project particularly is that precisely that partnership mm -hmm. between the institution and the food use of history is is and a specialist who can, come, can help to, to articulate it. But actually, it's probably, and it's, and the cathedrals are not, uh, not, um, there's not a great deal to spend money. Well, I, I imagine the symbols might be better than some of the others, but possibly not. And actually, so, um, it, it probably is, uh, that model of partnership does involve a longer term commitment to sustain it as well. But even as a small, small, it may not, may not be very much resource, but it is some resource on a long, on a long time scale. Yes, I think the way in is to say that we will enhance the visitor experience and hook it on that. The, the former dean did let me go into his study to see the portrait of John Dunn that's hanging on the wall in his study, but that's the major contribution of the cathedral so far. Do you acknowledge that? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. um, anything online or no? Okay. Uh, any other questions in the room? Actually, be, yeah. I have a brief question, actually. When you were giving your talk, you showed some pictures of what you did five years ago. And, um, and yeah. They looked really impressive compared to the 3D model you had done. But obviously, this is the type of thing that, as technology gets better, um, it looks less impressive. So there's a, there's a great exhibit of the Titanic in Belfast right now. And I would say, people, if you go to Belfast, go now, because in 10 years, it's going to look kind of lame. Um, and that's just the nature yes, of the way that yeah, this exactly. visualization works. Um, so has, has that come into your conversations at all? How do we make this look cool for as long as possible? Um, no, I would say we want to make it as realistic as possible. Uh, and I passed very quickly over that slide just saying there's a history in archaeology of straining to do this kind of thing. And so far, our efforts have been very crude. So with the advent of SketchUp and, and, and web-based technology, we hope to make a giant step forward. But no, I, I, I acknowledge what you say, that uh, um, after a while, your best model 
uh, you become ashamed of it. You, you yeah, I, the, the, here's the here's the fly around, and I don't like to look at it anymore. But after we've done done all the things we've done, um, but just for the sake of uh, we're you know everything is so clean and um, but dirtier than before. Uh, well, yeah, we but you know this is. Uh, on the other hand, um, I mean, you, you have the Victorian reconstructions, which yeah. you said actually, despite the fact they're self-evidently Victorian reconstructions, yeah. are still as good as we can do now. We haven't gone any further. Yeah. So, uh, the, surely what we would do is simply see this as a representative of its moment. It doesn't have to be continually cool. <laughs> <laughs> the Victorian one is still. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, yeah. Historicizing the historical re representation. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Enough. Well, all, all we can do is say thank you again. That was fantastic. Yes, indeed. Um, Our okay. pleasure. Our yeah. pleasure. And um, to um, remind people that um, we have a, the next meeting in a fortnight's time when um, Devin Elliott of the University of Western Ontario is speaking about magical experiments, levitation in the golden age of stage magic. And I hope you can come for that. Thanks again.